Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Cerebral Book Chat. I was thinking, what would be a useful book to use to look at? And I was going through my books, and I happened across a book I haven't looked at in quite some time. And I thought you might enjoy because it's kind of out of print, I believe, at least in the physical hard copy book. I believe you can get it on Kindle, but it's um, from 2001. And I've had my copy since then, since it was brand new. And it's called Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot. And you might be thinking, what? What does that mean? But the, the um, title is also called Unleashing Your Brain's Potential. So that's what this book is about. Here's the back. Um, Richard Restack, I believe, was the one who wrote it. Very famous, famous person. Um, he's a neuropsychiatrist. He's a neurologist. He's a clinical professor of neurology at George Washington University Medical Center. I'm not sure. He might be emeritus or emeritus, however you want to say it, um, now because that was quite some time ago. Um, but he's written so many books and a PBS series about the brain. So he's very, very knowledgeable. Um, about the brain. So that's why I thought this would be a really good book because literally that is cerebral. Talking about the brain that is cerebral, being able to be cerebral means that your brain is working and that your brain is functioning on all cylinders. And of course, being gifted means that your brain works even better um, than some other people's brain, meaning that the connections between the brain cells, the neurons, go faster because a lot of that is part of it. The speed of processing often does talk about the intelligence level. In fact, people who struggle with intelligence, people who have lower cognitive abilities, one of their problems is the ability to process things at a quick way, in a quick, you know, um, way. That's one of the biggest problems. Um, being an educational assistant, as I was, um, we would help a lot of students who weren't able to process things very fast. So then they're the ones that need extra help. But of course, gifted students also need extra help, maybe even more, but they don't often get it. So that's an issue, of course, that needs to be looked at. So getting back to this book. Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot. It's an old book now, as I was saying. It's an older book. It's not a book that you can just go to the bookstore and buy anymore, although I believe they do have a Kindle edition. So I thought, what a better book for our Cerebral Book Chat, episode two, um, because it really does help you build your brain up. It's a glorious book. It's got 28 ideas about how to heal and how to put your brain on the track of learning and knowledge and how to empower yourself. So definitely worth it if you want to look at it. And I was thinking in my own health and well-being that reading out loud is very helpful for me and may be helpful for other people who are auditory. So I thought I might try and read more of this book as well should you want to listen to it because I don't know if there is an audiobook version. But anyway, I thought it would be good for me and perhaps good for you as well. So we're going to look at the introduction. And the introduction says, where are we? Let's grab the introduction. It's all about how to be smarter. Because you might be thinking to yourself, well, can we be smarter? Isn't intelligence set? Not really. I mean, you're not going to be like super smart or you're not going to change it like 10 or 20 points probably but you can change it a few points maybe and you can use what you have in a more like synergistic positive way you can use what you have in a better more productive way as he says too like even your iq isn't better you can still make your brain work better with what you have and anybody can do that everybody can do that so that's what we're going to talk about um, let's look at the introduction, shall we? Most of us would like to be smarter, but how do we go about improving our mental prowess? That question isn't easily answered. For one thing, even if we could somehow raise our IQ a few points, as promised by many books and programs currently on the market, such an achievement wouldn't necessarily imply that intellectually we'd really be any better off. 
We all know people with high IQs whose adult accomplishments were less than impressive, and that is not usually their fault. Sometimes it is, but we could talk for three hours about why that is an issue that it is. Um, it's certainly something that's a passion of mine because most people um, aren't able to make use of their IQ in the way they would should the world be a better place for them, is what I mean. Um, so, a more realistic goal is to enhance our mental functioning in certain key areas that psychologists refer to as cognition. Briefly, cognition refers to the ability of our brain to attend, identify, and act. More informally, cognition refers to our thoughts, moods, inclinations, decisions, and actions. Included among the components of cognition are alertness, concentration, perceptual speed, learning, memory, problem solving, creativity, and mental endurance. So all of those things are wrapped up in what our brain does. And of course are impaired if we are impaired. If we have a brain injury, um, if we are an addict, say for example, if we have a mental illness, oftentimes that happens. Um, and even if we're just burned out, which is a bad enough thing in itself, right? Burnout is terrible. So any of those things are going to affect our ability to, you know, uh, work with our brain and to use cognition. Each of these components in, of cognition have two things in common. First, each is dependent on how well our brain is functioning. Second, each can be improved by our own efforts. In short, we can make ourselves smarter by enhancing the components of cognition. This book will provide you with methods for enhancing cognition by improving your brain's performance. Regular exercise of your brain's cognitive powers is the first step. Most of us now incorporate into our daily life some form of regular physical exercise. We do this because such efforts improve our general physical health and in addition make us feel better. A similar situation exists when it comes to exercising our brain. The more we exercise it, the better it performs and the better we feel. In addition, the brain, in contrast to other physical organs, does not wear out uh, with repeated and sustained use. It actually gets better. So that's good. On the contrary, the brain improves the more we challenge it. This observation has led to a fundamental principle about the brain's operation. Use it or lose it. I would absolutely say that to everybody. I am a poster child for that. Um, as those of my friends that actually know me, poster child, I shouldn't be able to be doing all this, and yet I am. So there you go. Um, use it or lose it. Think back to a talent or skill that you developed by practice and application, but subsequently allowed to languish. Perhaps you were a decent piano player at one time in your life, but later stopped your lessons because you didn't have time to practice. Or maybe, like me, you took chess lessons that enabled you to become a moderately competitive player. Competitive, that is, until you dismissed your instructor, cancelled the chess magazine subscriptions, and gradually gave up the game. In both of these instances, music and chess, changes took place in your brain. After the initial establishments of circuits for music and chess, your brain underwent kind of atrophy. As the circuits important for these activities disappear secondary to disuse. Because your brain can atrophy. Really, it really can. That is kind of what happens when you get like some kind of brain problem. Say Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that. Fortunately, the brain is highly resilient and has a lifetime memory. Those music and chess circuits can be revived. All that's required is that you start again playing the piano or some other instrument. Or you take up your chess lessons and engage in regular chess matches with some challenging players. This is possible because throughout our lives, the brain retains a high degree of plasticity. It changes in response to experience. If these experiences are rich and, and varied, the brain will develop a great number of nerve cell connections. But if the experiences are dull and infrequent, the connections will either never form or die off. We know this from studies carried out on laboratory animals and not just that. Children who are very, very deprived um, have a very big problem. There's been movies about children who's been very, very deprived. Um, their brains never really make it. They never really catch up. 
right? So your brain, especially when you're a baby, is terribly important that you get rich and stimulating activities to do. You won't make it up again. So that's what makes child abuse so terrible because you're not just injuring the child now, you're injuring their child for their whole life, really. So, um, and also something to be said about people in their older life. Do something useful, do something you wanna do, take up a new sport, you know, maybe that isn't too hard, or take up a new instrument, learn a new language, go back to school, whatever you wanna do, that's all so, so valuable. Learn how to bake, who knows? But all of those things are very, very helpful. So, for example, if an animal is provided with stimulating, challenging environment like a cage filled with toys, the animal's brain will show a dramatic increase in the number of nerve cell connection. The animal's brain will be heavier with larger nerve cells in some areas than animals who were reared in a barren, sterile, comparatively deprived laboratory cage. This increase in brain weight results from an increase in the number of synapses, electrochemical connections between neurons. So if you know anything about the brain, you know it's like a super highway, right? It's got all these on ramps and off ramps. It's got all these different roads. It's got different ways to get places. And it has these things called synapses. Now synapses are sort of they're kind of the edge of the neuron and onto the other one where people, people talk to each other, meaning that you and me are talking to each other because our synapses. So if, for example, if I was talking to a person, I can do that because my brain is making the power that I need and jumping the different synaptic, synaptic clefts which is the, the space between the two synapses. Um, and the more you have and the faster they work, you can get a lot done. <laughs> right so that's the thing that's happening gifted people have way more than other people do so they're usually more able so their highway just works better that's really what it is their highway just works better um but it's not like other people's highways can't work better too they really can work better so that's kind of what we're talking about as mentioned, a similar process occurs in the human brain. You can pre-select the kind of brain you will have by choosing richly varied experience. The process starts in childhood and continues until the day you die. Incidentally, this insight that the brain retains its plasticity, also known as neuroplasticity, across the lifespan is a comparatively new one. When I wrote my first book in the human brain in 1979, I didn't hear much from the scientists I interviewed about the plasticity of, you know, uh, the mature adult brain, who I think that's what we're kind of talking about here in Cerebral Book Chat. At the same time, most people, scientists included, believed that the brain matured and formed its nerve cell connections. Those connections stayed in place until finally dropping out in old age. Few people thought of the brain as being susceptible to change in its actual structure. Now, thanks to research like the experiments mentioned above, we know that the brain is much more malleable and subject to change. Indeed, we have no choice about whether our brain will change from the way it is today. The real question is, will we help bring about positive enriching changes in our brain structure and function? Or will we allow it to undergo disuse atrophy? That is a real thing. It's important to remember that our brain holds the key to everything we will ever accomplish. Indeed, the brain is the gateway for all our sensations and the weaver of all our experiences. And while most of us are convinced that exercise increases our physical well-being, it's less commonly appreciated that the brain must also be exercised it's a dynamic structure that improves with use and challenge. I became convinced of this while researching two previous books on longevity. Similarly put, an otherwise healthy older person can reduce his or her risk for developing dementia by remaining mentally active. But the benefits of an active challenge brain aren't just limited to later life. Rather, the use it or lose it formula applies to each and every one of us, no matter our age. Moreover, the healthy exercise of our brain's inherent powers is highly pressurable. Think back to occasions when you scored well in a test or prevailed in a debate or found yourself unable to put down a certain book because of the excitement you experienced 
well reading it. And that's one of the biggest things. Read, people. You've got to read. <laughs> it's really important. You've got to read. Your pleasure in each of these instances came from the exercise of your brain's cognitive powers. Further, there are specific steps you can take to increase and strengthen these powers. In essence, you can achieve more of the things you desire by enhancing your brain's cognitive functioning. And we all want that. For instance, memory is probably the most important cognitive function. We are what we remember. If you doubt this, spend a few minutes with people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. They no longer remember the most important and noteworthy events in their lives. Not only do they not remember their marriages, they may doubt even who their spouse is. Ask them what they once did for a living, and your answer may consist of nothing but a blank stare. Contrast this to a person that is endowed with a rich memory, who can recall events and people with clarity and richness. Thanks to memory, he or she can respond to detailed questions about the past and family vacations, favorite movies, books, appointments, and social engagements. You know, they all depend on memory. Um, yet, as we also recognize, poor memories are not simply limited to those who suffer from Alzheimer's disease and other diseases. Some of us are lucky and can remember faces and names from the distant past. Those of us with natural memory gifts have, have only to be told something once in order for it to be readily available for instant recall. Fortunately, those with endowed with less than efficient memories, steps can be taken to improve it. So those are kind of the people that people say, oh, you have a photographic memory, which is just you literally can remember anything that you're exposed to easily in a much more simple way than other people um, have um, access to. Useful and effective memory systems can be traced back as far as the Greeks. Aristotle wrote a short book on memory and compared the mind to a wax tablet that received the impressions of all new information. He suggested that with the passage of time, the clarity of the wax image would fade unless steps were taken to preserve it. Plato possessed prodigious powers of recall and considered memory as a force for personal integration with the spiritual forces of the cosmos. Well, I agree because I, I, am, I am a Platonist. I don't know if you are, but I'm definitely a Platonist. I'm quite a fan of Plato. He's I'm probably my favorite philosopher on um, this side of Bertrand Russell. Oh, I like him too. Yes. Okay, anybody, favorite philosopher, put it in the chat. <laughs> that's a good idea. So that's the cerebral part too. Who is your favorite philosopher? Okay, where are we? Okay, so Metrodori, as the first century BC Greek writer, uh, astounded friends and colleagues with his ability to remember conversations that he had had with them some, some years earlier. Indeed, the Greeks so venerated memory that they transformed it into a goddess, um, Mnemosyne, I think, mother of the muses. But the greatest con contribution of the Greeks to our contemporary understanding of memory was the insistence, starting with Plato, that memory could be trained. That or they originated the idea that we simply don't have to accept our natural memory talents or back thereof. It is possible for us to improve our memory. The same can be said about all of the other components of cognition. And I absolutely agree with that. This book will provide you with specific positive steps you can take to get smarter and stay smarter. It is based on an important principle. The more you learn about how your brain works, the better your chances of using it more efficiently, optimizing your intellectual capabilities, and accomplishing even more in life than many people who may score higher than you on standard intelligence tests. What follows are 28 suggestions and some accompanying exercises for enhancing your brain's performance. These suggestions are based on my own experiences over a career that has included the writing of 12 books on the human brain while simultaneously maintaining a full-time practice in neurology and neuropsychiatry. In response to the competing demands of this dual career track, I have learned how to get the best possible performance from my brain. After discovering what worked for me, I started several years ago compiling a list of suggestions 
anyone can follow in order to increase his or her brain efficiency. My aim in Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot is to convey to you an understanding of the basic principles of brain operation. Once you understand those principles, you can follow the 28 suggestions and perhaps even come up some of your own based on sound operating principles that will help you improve your brain function. Let's start right off with the first and in many ways the most important of all of the suggestions outlined in this book. So I am going to leave you with that because you might be just like, what is the first one? So it might, you know, you might be motivated to check the book out, Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot, or you might just want to wait. Um, I'm going to probably do chapter one soon, and then you can just listen to it if you want. So I think that would be enormously helpful and good for everybody. So I hope you enjoyed uh, Cere Cerebral Book Chat episode two, and we'll come back again. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon.